Hello there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Strategy International Podcast. Appreciate you being back here. Thank you so much. Um, For those who don't know, Strategy International is a global uh, think tank with a wide array of experts uh, in all fields, including security, defense, international relations, um, uh, environment, economy, and and much, much, much more. You can visit the website at www.strategyinternational.org where you'll be able to get more information on Strategy International, read a bunch of uh, opinion editorials and publications from all these experts. Speaking of experts, we have one with us today. Dr. Michael Grossman, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate your time. I know that you're a busy man. You're all busy. Everyone coming on the podcast is busy. So the fact that you can take a little bit of time and share your knowledge uh, and the value to our listeners and viewers is much appreciated. Thank you so much for that. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit um, uh, together on your area of specialty, which is uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, U.S. foreign policy. There's a lot of things going on. We've spoken, obviously, about (laughs) the the, the conflict, obviously, in Eastern Europe quite a bit. But there are some new developments uh, and we haven't spoken about the conflict in a while. So it's been it's going to be nice to touch base a little bit on what's happening over there. Uh, before we start, let me just uh, briefly introduce to our to our viewers and our listeners. You are uh, professor of international affairs and national security at the University of Mount Union uh, in the U.S., obviously. Uh, and you are a valued member of Strategy International. You are a senior consultant on all matters related to national security and as well uh, the director of the Government Military and Defense Affairs Program. Whew. Long. That was a long. Uh, that was a long <laughs> intro. <laughs> Thanks again for being uh, on the program. Uh, before we get started, I I, I like to uh, just you know a, a little on a personal uh, level with our guest, just out of curiosity, mostly you know what got your curiosity, uh, and your interest to follow this path into politics, international, um, national security, international affairs. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I was I was I was I was born originally in Russia. Family is Russian and Ukrainian. Um, <clears throat> you know, we kind of immigrated. We left we left Russia in 1973. Uh, moved to Israel right before the Yom Kippur War. Left Israel right after the Yom Kippur War. <laughs> moved to the United States. So I've always been, you know, kind of uh, very much involved. Family's been very much involved in politics. Um, you know, there was a reason why we left Russia because my family, my mother was a dissident. Uh, I often joke that she was politely asked by the KGB to leave the Soviet Union. Oh. Uh, as politely as the KGB can ask somebody to leave the Soviet Union, I guess. Right. Um, so we've always been involved. You know, this is kind of like I've grown up in this atmosphere. Um, and to me, especially what's going on now, you know, because of my own background is very personal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, f- family connections pretty much. All over but but that, that must be, uh, you know, it's very interesting the fact that, you know, uh, your family i mean you were born in that neck of the woods right i mean you, yeah. you lived uh in, in in soviet era uh russia You're, uh, how was that how was it growing up in that in, in that period of time especially with parents or like you said your mom kind of going counter current well i i was i was three years old when we left oh. <laughs> so i could so i didn't remember very well don't remember much uh, but you know, it was. It, it, I have stories, right? I mean, my mother was. She was part of the uh, Summers Dot Press, so she was doing a lot of the smuggling and li- books, banned books, into the Soviet Union. Um, you know, she was. She was. She was active. She. She. When the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia, she protested. Um, she was not one of these people who, despite anything that the government would throw at her, she would keep quiet. <laughs> so. Um, you know, it, it it was it was it was interesting. I mean, I, I, certainly the stories that she told me was that there, there was it was an interesting time. Um, you know, and then like I said, traveling to Israel, that's my memories are much clearer there. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, we lived there for 
a few years um during during a like I said during the during the war and you know I often joke that I'm I'm one of the few people that I know who actually spend any time in a bomb shelter right um so you know like I said this is all the, these are all very kind of formative events yeah and and and, and it's come full circle um uh, I mean you know back to almost where it started right I mean leaving uh, back to that area where it all started for you and your family moving out right um yeah. and we're gonna get to that area because <clears throat> excuse me th- there have been interesting uh developments um and again for anyone interested listening or watching that wants to read further on you know Russia and Ukraine there's much written on um strategyinternational.org that as well as other uh interesting uh, opinion editorials and articles that I invite all of you to go and check it out uh but Russia and Ukraine I I mean from the very beginning did you ever think that this conflict would last this long i mean i don't think anyone with any expertise thought that oh yeah the ukrainians are going to endure um you, you know the, the this attack from the russians i i honestly you know kind of i am surprised that the that the, that the war has evolved the way it has um and it's not so much that the ukrainians endured or they're fighting back because you know I, the, the 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 people of this part of the world their fighters mm-hmm. um but I, to, to me honestly i was more I, i'm quite surprised that that this that it evolved the way it is because because to some extent i mean you know, there's it, it is the ties between russia and ukraine are familial right i mean and i'm not talking about like familial like the way putin was talking about you know they're all one people Mm-hmm. it's more in terms of that there are these very strong t- connections you know again take my family for example you know i mean my family's originally from odessa um right i mean my my father my grandfather left odessa after the revolution to go study in moscow and that's where he met my grandmother and that's you know how i came to be um but still family is still there right or at least they were they all left um and and, and my story is not that unique you know, for a lot of Russians, they have Ukrainian relatives, uh, husbands, wives, parents, grandparents, uh, and vice versa. You know, there are a lot of Ukrainians who are very much connected to Russians. Mm-hmm. So to me, honestly, this conflict is, 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 is very, it's strange. It's also very tragic. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it, do, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, so why is it happening then, Michael? Well, I think, I think, I, I suspect the way, well, the, the reason why it's happening, I mean, to, to me, the explanation lies in security, right? I mean, I think after 2014, the Russians got very concerned that, in fact, there is, that the West, especially NATO, the United States, have decided that it is time to move east much more aggressively than they did in the past mm-hmm. by 2008 in the Bucharest summit nato summit um nato kind of announced it was basically going to be bringing in georgia and ukraine into the into into into, into its organization right shortly thereafter russia goes to war with georgia i mean to me it was not a big surprise um so i think that's why it's happening Right. I think I think fundamentally uh the Russians, certainly the Putin Putin and his and the elites, and we know this, you know, the Nick Burns, um, the current CIA director at that time he was ambassador to Moscow, uh basically said that, you know, this is a red line. You can, we cannot bring Ukraine and Georgia into the into NATO. This is this is a red line. Um even Angela Merkel pointed out that the reason why she was opposed to bring it to to making that statement in the 2008 Bucharest summit was because she knew this would mean war. Um, so that's what it really comes down to, you know. And I and I think that it, you know it, it, it's it, the the fear, the concern overrode everything else. Right? And and I suspect probably to some extent 
You know, this is, I think, I think the, the, this familial connection, you know, we got to remember also, you know, P- Putin's goddaughter is Ukrainian, right? So even he has connections there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, was the reason why Russians went in the way they did in the beginning, right? I think, you know, good. they went in with very, very few forces, truthfully, right? They had about 190,000 troops uh, to try to take a country the size of Ukraine. It's ridiculous. Um, I think they kind of, you know, because they were expecting that these familial to- forces would just, these, these ties would somehow materialize, right? Mm-hmm. And the Ukrainians would welcome them. Right. Um, that there was some kind of separation between the government and the people. I, th- I, don't th- I think the Russians, to some extent, misunderstood what was going on, actually. Um, I think they misunderstood the, 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 the kind of, um, the ties that they saw existed did not, did not, were not necessarily shared by all Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, at the same time, there's there's a huge contrast between 2014 when Russia uh, illegally annexed Crimea at the time when no one, practically nobody said anything versus now where there's this overwhelming support from Europe and all the Western countries um, towards Ukraine, which has definitely helped them. Uh, I mean, people are wondering mm-hmm. how Ukraine has lasted uh, this long and how, um, you know, the, the soldiers and their army has endured. I think that has a, a big part to play in the fact that they're getting all sorts of support from uh, from all these countries. Um, why the support now and not in 2014? Or why not make a point then that, look, we don't want war. Let's draw the line over here and send a signal to Russia that don't cross this line. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, I think actually there was stuff happening in 2014. I mean, the first, the first kind of tranche of, of sanctions, you know, happened after 2014, right? <clears throat> um, certainly Obama was, was hesitant to send any kind of weapons to Ukraine, but Trump did. Um, so we still had, I mean, I, I think certainly the support isn't as stark as it is now. And I think there was some hope to resolve the conflict in terms of the Minsk agreements. Um, but also, as we learned that, you know, in Poroshenko, former president, former Ukrainian president Poroshenko basically said, you know, they were no, they, they had no real intention of fulfilling the Minsk agreements. Um, so I think to some extent, there was still hope, right, among the Europeans, at least. Mm-hmm. Certainly the French and the Germans. Um, so maybe there was some 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 hope, and I and I think there's a different dynamic here, right? When Crimea was taken, I mean, fact is Crimea was part of Russia since Catherine the Great, right? Um, <clears throat> it was in '54 when Khrushchev basically gave Crimea to Ukraine. At that point, it didn't really matter because it was part of the Soviet Union. So who cared who actually who actually yeah. technically controlled it? Um, but so so I think I, I think an argument could have been made. And an argument was made that, look, the fact is Crimea, you know, yes, the Russians took it illegally, but at the same time, more likely than not, I mean, if you look at the history since independence, Crimea was always trying to break away from Ukraine in some form or another. Mm -hmm. Um, Crimea is dominant, dominant, I mean, majority, vast, huge majority in Crimea are are Russians. Uh, It was basically, you know, it was home for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. This is where a lot of Russians went to retire. Um, it was if a, if if a, if a boat was actually held, you know, under anybody's auspices, it would have probably voted to join Russia. Mm-hmm. So I think it was Crimea was kind of a different situation, right? Um, than what we see now. Uh. Tell, you know, this, this whole conflict has evolved so much from the very beginning. Uh, we're, we're coming to a point right now where obviously the winter is setting in. The Russians are continuously shelling uh, uh, the energy sector in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Europe is fearing, obviously, uh, especially the countries that depended on um, on Ukraine to, 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 to get their energy. So uh, there's a completely different dynamic now going into the winter than going into the spring. Uh, at the beginning of this conflict, but I'm interested to know what is happening on the other side. I mean, we always talk about Ukraine, and we're always looking at the conflict from that perspective. But what's happening uh, 
in Russia with respect to this conflict. I know that in the very beginning, uh, you know, the government was very, very quick to control the media and the rhetoric. Uh, they were quick to um, uh, to arrest people that had um, uh, any any sort of messages that were against this uh, this conflict. Uh, but slowly, slowly, I think a, a month or two ago, uh, there was this unity of uh, mayors from big Russian cities that had uh, signed the petition against the uh, the conflict. There, there seemed to be this movement happening against it, but we don't know much more of you know behind that that you know that line. What's happening in Russia? Well, I think I I, I well okay. So if you look at opinion polls. And like legitimate opinion polls, actually independent with Levada centers, the one I usually look at. Um, there's widespread support for this. Um, I I would argue to some extent the West misplayed its hand. Right? Um rather than you you, you see a lot in the West now where they're basically kind of, you know, it's not that they're sanctioning the government, right? They're actually sanctioning the Russian people. So you will see places where, you know, Russian uh, musicians aren't allowed to play and, you know, Russian athletes aren't allowed to go or whatever, right? So I worry that the impression that is being given to a lot of Russians nowadays is that, in fact, I suspect the way a lot of Russians are starting to perceive this is that this is, in fact, you know, the West is at war with them. Mm -hmm. This isn't a war with Ukraine. This is, in fact, a war between them and NATO, um, and an, or in the in the form of a proxy in Ukraine, um, which for me is, you know, I, I I suspect that is swaying opinion now, right? And I think to some extent it was, you know, misplayed by the West um, in that they. They 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 kind of it is less about you know opposition to government policies and it became an opposition to the russian people itself mm -hmm. it, it, it's very interesting uh, obviously there's a lot of things coming out and um I, I think also depending on the media that we get over here uh we're getting a lot of uh, news to the effect that people are actually trying to stand up to um to putin but like you mm. pointed out when you look at internally and the polls people seem to be quite in favor of it is, is there some sort of propaganda happening on that side or is just just their belief that this is the right thing for russia to be doing <clears throat> i think i think i think as this war progressed that view has come more and more into play all right i think initially a lot of folks, and I, in, in fact, you know, in the early in the early weeks of the war, this is what my argument to a great extent is that, you know, Russia want, will, Putin will want to end this war as fast as possible mm -hmm. because of these familial ties, you know, because at some point he's no longer fighting Ukrainians. Now he's killing my brother or my brother-in-law or my uncle or, you know, and I and I was arguing that at some point this is going to become a, a, a an issue, right? But as the West got more involved, as the sanctions were, were piled up, as kind of the, you know, what can be easily argued from the Russian perspective, this kind of level of Russophobia started to rise in the West. Um, I think opinions started to shift, right? And you see this in the polling. Like I said, you see this in the polling. And you also see it in terms of, you know, There are certainly a lot of Russians who are not happy about what's happening, right? But, you know, when you have Biden coming out and saying that basically, you know, this guy's got to go, right? Almost implying that there's a, a, a policy underlying this whole thing of regime change. Mm -hmm. Like a secret. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you have people like Lloyd Austin saying that the goal is to basically weaken Russia, right? If you really think about it, that inevitably is going to bring about a rally around the flag. Mm-hmm. Right. Because even for Russians who will turn around and say, look, we hate this guy. We don't like Putin. But in the end, it's up to us to get rid of him, not you. Right. Right. Um, so you see a lot of like, you know, I, I, I think the, the harder the West pushes, the more the rally around the flag is going to happen. And I think that's a normal 
that's a normal reaction. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk to you since you're obviously much more aware of things happening on the ground. And again, I want to bring you back to the media and to the messages that we're getting here uh, in the West. Uh, and to to what extent is that message or those messages that we're getting biased? We, we're continuously being told that, you know, there's this sentiment of recreating this greater Russia, right? Uh, perhaps not the Soviet Union, but something close to that. Uh, and there's a secret agenda that Putin has been trying to promote for, for a long time. Is this really a, a, a vivid belief or is this propaganda from our end? No, you, no, I'll tell you, I don't believe that there's any kind of goal of creating a larger Russia. Um, there's no evidence for it, right? I mean, Putin had opportunities. Uh, fact is, in 2014, when the Russian military went in into this, you know, into into, into the Donbas area uh, and pushed back the Ukrainian military, they could have kept going if he wanted to, but instead he pulled back, right? We also need to remember that both... Um, Luhansk and Donetsk, both of them voted to, to join Russia, right? And Putin's response was, no, you're part of Ukraine, right? We're going to make the Minsk agreements work. You're part of Ukraine. So he had opportunities, right? Um, and I mean, again, if you look at, and, and, there's, and, and honestly, I mean, there's no, there's, no real, there's no real appetite for it in Russia. Again, look at polling. Even 2014 and onwards polling, there was no real interest in, in expansion in, in expanding Russia. Um, I think I, I would argue this whole, like I said, to, to me, this whole war comes down to NATO expansion, right? At least a, a, a good chunk of it of NATO is, is driven by NATO expansion. Uh, there's certainly maybe other kind of things in there, but I don't I don't think it's actually building a greater Russia. Mm -hmm. Um you know, there's there's there was a joke in Russia for a long time that you know they can't even pick up our garbage properly. Why do they want to take over another country? <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's it, it, it's not it's not. I I don't think that's part of it. I think it is genuinely. <clears throat> it is genuinely geostrategic in thinking, right? Putin said when when you know when 2014 happened when the Maidan thing happened, um, and he, he took over Crimea. He actually said, look. The reason why he took our Crimea is because he didn't want to show up in Sevastopol and be greeted by NATO. Right? This is it. This is this is this is what we are saying. And to me, to me, this is the real kind of you know um, tragic part of this whole conflict is that it could have been avoided if you know when 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 Russia in 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 January, December, January, was basically asking the West to like look, just say. Guarantee Ukrainian neutrality. Say that there'll be no more NATO, no no NATO expansion. The West kept saying, "No, no, no. We're not going to do that. We're not going to give you those kind of guarantees." Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it's not it's not an expansionist. It's not imperialist. You know, um, it is hundred percent geostrategic. Speaking uh, speaking of NATO, uh, not a, again, not hundred percent, ninety five percent geostrategic. <laughs> yeah. What's the other five percent? I don't. Five percent. It could be, you know. The, the, I, I think an argument can be made to some extent that um, domestic political support, right? The rally around the flag syndrome does help um, politicians. Um, there could be some. I think partially it was also the sense that, um, and this is something Russia has been push has been saying since Yeltsin's period. The defense of fellow fellow Russians, right? Um, but I think the the large large percentage of it was just purely geostrategic. He saw NATO coming closer and closer to the borders, and it made them nervous. It made it did, it didn't make them nervous. It, it terrified them. I want to ask you specifically about NATO and the fact that he, you know, there's claims that maybe the, 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 there was this fear or, you know, you're saying that it terrified to have NATO literally at, its, uh, at Russia's border. And I, I understand that, that that argument. But there's this other argument on the other side that claims that NATO isn't that healthy as an organization anymore. I mean, there there's a lot of division within NATO. We're seeing countries uh, like Turkey, for example, that is kind of playing you know both sides uh there are talks of another alliance now uh including major countries like turkey russia china and india 
um, that are definitely going to change this sort of balance of power uh, in, in the region. How how effective is NATO? Um, does it? I mean, uh, does it still have that role? I mean, the, the Cold War technically has ended. Um, mm-hmm. there, there's another organization called the EU that technically should be uh, in a position to defend its territory. So what, what the question always comes back to what is NATO doing there? See, this is this is this is the, this is what. Well, you know, first of all, there, there was this. Well, you know, I I, I know I don't remember who said this was. I think it was a U.S. congressman who basically said, you know, after the Cold War, NATO need, either needs to go out of theater or go, go out of business. Mm. Right. So NATO expanded to do Afghanistan and you know several other things. Um, would you say that was kind of interesting because it's kind of ironic, right? In that Russia was concerned about a alliance that I think was. I don't think it was fra- as fragmented as 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 you as you as you might think, but it was it was certainly had fissures, right? As it as it expanded, it developed more and more fissures. Um, but by its action, it actually gave NATO more unity, mm-hmm. right? Which I think is the ir- ironic part of this whole thing. Is I think to some extent, and I think I think that this is this is look. I think I think to some extent Russia miscalculated on a lot of levels when it invaded. Right. And to some extent, and, and as a result, I mean, I was one of these folks who up until the the the, the, the they actually crossed the border, I was like, this isn't going to happen. They're not going to invade. They're not they're not this silly. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the reason why I was always arguing that this isn't going to happen is because I I I I I knew the consequences or I sensed what the consequences were going to be. Um I think the Russians miscalculated. I think they thought Europe was a lot more divided. There was a lot less unity between the Europeans and the Americans. I think they thought that, you know, this was going to be much easier. And this was the miscalculation, right? There may have been some sense that, look, the fissures in Europe, if we invade Ukraine, these fissures will, if anything, they might actually widen even more and NATO will completely crack, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But I think they misunderstood. I think they, like I said, they, they... they didn't understand how far the Europeans were actually willing to go in terms of sanctions. I mean, you know, I think the Europeans, <clears throat> you look at what's going on in Germany right now. I mean, their economy is just reeling. I mean, I I, I was reading that it's going to have like, probably it's going to shrink as much as it did right after night or after World War II. Um, you know, and, and all the European economies are absolutely reeling. Um, and I think the Russians miscalculated how far the Europeans are willing to actually, how, m- how much pain they're willing to take in order to go on and, you know, send a message or fight back. Um, I think the Russians miscalculated just how, <clears throat> what kind of impact it would have on NATO, that rather than in, in opening up these fissures, it will actually, you know, tighten up the alliance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the Russians miscalculated on a lot of levels. Well, not only not only tighten up the alliance, but then you had immediate reaction to countries that feared Russia immediately seek joining uh, NATO, yeah. right? Like yeah. we're talking about um, uh, Sweden and uh, Finland, I Finland. think. Yeah, Sweden and Finland. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. Um, I think, I think, I think. Like I said, I, I think this is. Uh, I think, I think, on a lot of levels, Russia miscalculated. You know, like I said earlier, I think they miscalculated the fact that. They, I, I suspect, and this could be a failure of intelligence. It could be just Putin's own beliefs that you know that there was there was a great separation between the government and the people of Ukraine. That the Ukrainians will just you know will say, okay, you know what, forget about these guys in, in Kiev. We are we 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 you know we're brother Slavs. We're going to go run to the Russians and welcome them. I don't think they understood the dynamic that actually was unfolding. Um, what's interesting about it is though, and I think Putin, when he, when he met with the mothers of the soldiers, I think he kind of implied and indicated this is that, you know, um, he understood, he, 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 he talked about how he made a mistake, right? That he, he misunderstood the situation that in fact, he should have done this a lot earlier, right? When Ukraine was weaker. Um, when Europe was less united, um, 
but I, 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 I think one of the biggest issues that just, they, they, I, I think, and I don't know whether it was a failure of intelligence or what, but they misunderstood the situation in a lot, in a lot of sense. You know, recently, uh, this just a couple <clears throat> days ago, uh, we, we we saw in the news that Ukraine had launched um, drone attacks on Russia's uh, airfields for the first time. They're attacking, you know, hundreds of yeah. miles in, in into Russia. Uh, I'm not so sure. I haven't followed up yet if whether or not Kiev has claimed that responsibility. Because initially they said that it wasn't um, it wasn't an order given by Kiev. But what's interesting in this situation is that immediately we saw the U.S. coming out to denounce these actions, uh, which I found interesting for two reasons. One, uh, uh, I, 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 there, there is there. I'm just wondering if there's some level of hypocrisy there because I mean we just spoke early on that the reason that Ukraine or one of the reasons, main reasons that Ukraine has withstood this. Uh, uh, this attack from the Russians is because of all the the, the help that they've been receiving in arms and in uh, you know financial aid uh, from the Western countries, <laughs> and clearly <clears throat> it's been used against the Russians. But now that there's a drone attack in Russian territory, <clears throat> uh, the U.S. comes out and kind of denounces it. Well, I think I think there's a couple of things at play here. <laughs> first of all, if you think about it, first thing think about where one of the bases they hit. All right, Angles Air Base. What's on Angles Air Base? It's Russia's strategic bomber force. Right? So these are the guys, these are the planes that carry the big warheads, big nuclear warheads. So you know some of those warheads are stored on that military base. God forbid one of those missiles hit, a, hit one of the warheads. Um, now Russia has a pretext to actually go nuclear. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's one thing. <laughs> And I think to some extent, you know, on the other hand, also the United States has told the Ukrainians don't don't attack within Russia. Um, because I think I think there's some interest in trying to at least contain this thing. Because look, fact is, is <laughs> if the Ukrainians actually, I mean, you know, what's interesting is some of these some of these missiles actually went further than Moscow. Right? I think one of them hit an air base that was actually, if you look at it, it was further away from Ukraine than Moscow was further away from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So if the Ukrainians actually decide to hit Moscow, right, you know, then you get into a real issue because now the rally around the flag thing really hits, right? Russia, up until uh, up until recently, up until, up until this most recent mobilization, right, was only using about ten to twenty percent of its military forces, right? I think with the mobilization, it's now up to like eighty percent, right? Um, if it feels that its territory is actually being threatened, all gloves come off. And then we mm -hmm. really don't know what Russia is going to do, right? Will it go nuclear? Don't know. Um, will it basically mobilize, actually, in fact, do a full, you know, not a partial mobilization, but a full mobilization, right? Um, it can get much uglier than it is now. Now it's already pretty ugly. But how did Russia's uh, defense systems uh, miss that? Oh, I don't know, but somebody's getting fired. <laughs> isn't you know, that, I, yeah, isn't that indicative of just everything that's gone wrong so far uh, with Russia's military? It could be. It could be. I, I look. You know, I, I suspect. I mean, when this when these missile strikes happened, Putin was in. You know, he was driving across the Crimean Bridge to show everybody out. I can guarantee when he came back to Moscow, there was somebody getting screamed at. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, this 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 is I I think I think to some extent it may have been that you know because th they were preparing for that missile barrage that happened shortly after those missiles hit, so maybe they were not focusing on that stuff. Maybe they were focusing on getting the missiles ready to fly. Um, maybe they just didn't believe that the Ukrainians could do something like this. I mean, basically, as I understand it, these two drones were actually Soviet-made old uh, jet-powered ones that they that the Ukrainians modified mm -hmm. into cruise missiles. Um, so maybe the Russians just didn't really think that, you know, these old clunky things that were built in the 1980s that weren't even, you know, supersonic or were like little, barely supersonic, um, maybe they didn't think that they were much of a threat. Um, 
Uh, somebody's getting fired. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, somebody's getting fired. But um, did Kiev did, did Kiev finally um, uh, issue any statement with respect to that? I, didn't, I, I they, haven't seen. I haven't. Yeah. I haven't seen anything about that. Because I know that. I, I mean, you know, we we know it's that we know. I mean, they know they did it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, wh- whether whether it was official or not, remember the people in Ukraine are saying, "Yeah, we did it." Um, yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you the truth. I think I think this is this this is the one thing. I mean. It, it, I, 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 I don't think it'll happen again, All right? I think this is, you know, they, they it's, it's the same like when you had the the drone attacks on the air base in uh, Crimea, right? It got through, then the Russians put up air defenses, and when the, the next time the Ukrainians sent in drones, they were shot down, mm-hmm. All right? I think basically what it is is, you know, um, <laughs> they're not... As with any war, you know, you kind of learn as you go along, right? It's one of those, oh, they can do that? Well, then we better start pre- pre- preparing for it, right? Oh, they can do that? We better start preparing for that. You know, I think I think it's hard. The best laid plans, the minute contact happens, any kind of war plans go right out the window. That's always the case. All right. Um, you know, and it and it becomes a question of okay, so how good are, is the military in terms of adapting and figuring it out? Um, somebody's going to get fired. Russians will put better defenses around their air bases. So, so w- w- what's happening right now with uh, the U.S. and Russia relations? Are they completely non-existent? Uh, is anything still on the table? I mean, we just saw today at the at the time that we're recording this. Um, you, you know that basketball player, the, the the female basketball player, Brittany Griner, who was arrested in in Russia, was finally sent back with uh, the the the, uh, the agreement that they would take in exchange uh, a Russian prisoner that was in the That's U.S. Smooth, yeah, and not just any Russian prisoner, uh, one one of the biggest Russian arms dealers. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> what's happening over there with that? Well, I think I think look, it, th- there are no relations left. I, I, they really aren't, and the, to me, this is. I mean, we saw this in the uh, for, for the negotiations, also the nuclear negotiations, were supposed to happen in, I believe, in Egypt, mm-hmm. uh, where basically the Russians said, "No, we're not. We're not talking to you." You know, and I think this is this is. I'll tell you, so this this to me is like it, it, it's it's a really it, it it is it is it is a very precarious time. Okay, even during the Cold War, we talked. Right, there is no real negotiations left at mm-hmm. this point. There is minor discussions that you still hear. You know, like um, you heard talk between right the, the 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 Lloyd Austin talk to his counterpart, or the head of the CIA talk to his counterpart. Um, right, but it's mostly just minor things. You know, maybe deconfliction situations, um, but serious negotiations, the kind that need to be happening. Um, I don't think I, you know, I, 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 I sense that there's no interest in it. Right, right now we're in a situation where the West is convinced, and the United States is convinced that Ukraine can win this thing. Mm-hmm. Right, and from the Russian perspective, they feel that with this mobilization, that they're going to now, and and the, you know, you see what's happening around Bakhmut, um, that. <laughs> They're gonna. They're they're making progress, right? So it's almost kind of like neither side is willing to talk because both sides have nothing to talk about. What is what is the biggest fear here, Michael? I mean, if if there if both sides are close to any sort of talks to any sort of negotiations, if the West believe that Ukraine is in it because they could win. But inversely, Russia mobilizes its army to the point where <clears throat> there's a threat that they may eventually take over Ukraine. Wouldn't that initiate a bigger action from the West? Wouldn't that be a full-fledged war at that point? Are we headed down that path? You see, this is this is the biggest fear, okay? Because look, I, so, I, you know, President Kennedy in 1963, he made a speech in um, American University. It's really famous. It's it's his, it's his peace. So it's called his peace speech. And he actually said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he basically said that, look, 
in a, in a world of nuclear weapons, nu- nuclear powers, you cannot put a nuclear state or a nuclear powered state or nuclear armed state in a situation where it either accepts humiliating defeat or uses nuclear weapons. Right? You cannot give it that choice because it's irresponsible. And to me, the strangest part of this whole thing is that that is exactly what the West is trying to do to Russia. We're trying to put in a situation where it either accepts humiliating defeat or it uses nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Right? And my fear is that Russia will inevitably use nuclear weapons because the more successful we are, we being the Ukrainians of the United States and the West, the more successful we are, the more likely the Russians will, in fact, use nuclear weapons. Right? Because for the Russians, Ukraine is an existential threat. Right? They already see, and, they, and, and again, go back to Nick Burns, right? When he was ambassador to, to, to Russia under, under the Bush administration. He said this, right? This is the brightest of all red lines. And he said, you know, that he talked to everybody in the Kremlin, from, from knuckle draggers to people who oppose Putin. And all the elites say Ukraine in NATO is a red line. Mm-hmm. They will they will go to war for this. Um, to them, this is existential, right? I have argued that the Russians, it's not that they won't lose this war. They can't lose this war, right? They cannot lose this war, which means then the question becomes is, excuse me, the question becomes is how far are they willing to go to win this war, right? And that's really... That's really the, the question that we need to be asking ourselves, right? How far are we willing to go? How far are we willing to push the Russians? Right? Which is what's troubling to me right now, which is like, you know, why I think I think we're starting to hear these voices coming up finally. <clears throat> the negotiations are necessary. We gotta start talking. Right. Um Millie, General Millie. Um published, uh, says, says, uh, t- talked to the press a while back, and he basically said something along the lines of, you know, the Ukrainians have basically done all they can do at this point. Right? We, we kind of need to start negotiations. Um, and I think that's, it was finally starting to kind of dawn on them, because you know, like I said, I mean, it's not that the Russians won't lose this war, it's that the Russians can't lose this war. And because they see it as existential. Right. If if they lose the war in their minds, that's it. Russia is destroyed. Is because from that point on, they will have NATO on their border. Um, you know, and that's going to become a very serious threat because at that point, the, the entire system starts to sh- starts to come apart. Mm-hmm. Is mediation off the table early on? Uh, I know Turkey uh, had stepped up to uh, to offer its um, uh, to offer its service as a mediator. Not much really happened, although they kind of did uh, facilitate, um, you know, with mm-hmm. a conflict with a with a with a with a passage and the grain uh, transport. Some people may have seen kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel, where through Turkey something may happen, but we're not really hearing much. Well, I mean, we had more than that. I mean, you know, in in was it in March, <laughs> April, we had we actually had an agreement on the table, and then you know that famous trip of. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson to Kiev, who basically said, you know, he told him to scrap the deal. Um, so, I mean, we had, th- there was room. The problem being is, you know, as these conflicts progress, um, goals change, right? So originally, Russia's goal was, look, implement the Minsk agreements, Ukraine, you know, um, declares neutrality, NATO, in, in, in what, what, you know, leaves, stops messing with Ukraine, everything's, you know, Ukraine becomes a real, genuine, neutral country on our border. Um, but as this thing progressed, right, Russia enacts the territories. So now it's those territories are part of Russia, right? Um, I think rhetorically, Zelensky has also walked himself into kind of a dead end. And now he's talking that the only way this thing will end is if they get all Ukrainian territory back, including Crimea, um, which is just a ridiculous thing. I mean, no, nobody in their right mind actually thinks Ukraine will ever get back Crimea. Um, the problem being is like, I think, I think conditions on the ground and rhetoric have made both sides positions much more difficult to negotiate at this point. All right. So I think right now, unfortunately, we're kind of at this point that something big has got to happen. All right. Um, uh, perhaps uh, I, my personal suspicion is that come wintertime, 
Uh, when I mean, I suspect right now, looking at the battlefield, Bakhmut is probably going to fall within the next month. Uh, and once Bakhmut falls, then the, basically a lot of the Ukrainian line collapses. Right? And then, you know, maybe the the with, with that kind of, if Russia suddenly has that kind of victory, or if there's something else, if Bakhmut doesn't fall, and in fact, the, the line was in the other direction, maybe then negotiations will start to happen. Um, I don't know. I, I really, I, to, to me, I'll tell you the truth. My the, my, my big, you, you asked what's the, the kind of the big concern is that concern is that, you know, if from Russia's perspective, they have to win this. Mm -hmm. They now, at this point, they have to win this. Um, and that becomes a question, well, how far they want to go in order to win this. Interesting. Uh, Michael, I've taken a lot of your time. I want to thank you for the knowledge that you've given and the value that you've given to the, um, uh, to the listeners and to all the viewers. I want to remind everyone to head on over to strategyinternational.org for all other information, publications, articles, uh, other experts such as Michael that are uh, working with uh, Strategy International doing some amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Michael. Well, no, happy to be here. Thank you all so much, and I'll uh, see you all on the next episode. Have a good day.